Okay. Good afternoon again. Uh, we have towards the end of the day. Good thing that I don't have to speak after a chocolate, which has been really tough. <laughs> so it has been learning experience for me. I have learned quite a lot. So thankful to all of you who have participated uh, effectively. And it has been a very interactive session. I really enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, in terms of way forward, I, I'd like to put them in three buckets. Bucket number one is the research and analysis. So that came out very clear from the opening session. That evidence that we have right now is not, we don't have a consensus on that. The estimates of losses that we have, we don't have any consensus on that. So we have to clarify what it is that we are looking at. So there are two things we are looking at. We are looking at losses, we are looking at waste. These are two different things. When FAO suggests the number 30%, it is food waste and losses together. And losses are growing as the country is going, countries are going through economic transformation, waste is growing. I grew up in Bangladesh in the 70s. Waste was not a big issue, it was not an issue. It was right after the famine, 1974, where 200,000 people died. But now you go there, go to a wedding, waste is obvious. You see that it's happening. Now if you do estimate now, we we'll clearly see that that waste has gone. That is a social responsibility to prevent it. It is happening in OECD countries, it is happening in transforming countries. That estimate is big, but we don't have a clear understanding on that. We don't have a clear understanding even of the methodology of doing that. For losses, it's the same thing. Estimates that are being thrown out out there, these are based on a small sample. Numbers that we have seen from Bangladesh is based on a small sample survey, useful, done by colleagues from the Bangladesh Agricultural University. So we have a challenge there. That challenge is coming up with a robust methodology. Think about just sampling framework of estimating loss of food commodities. It's going to be extremely difficult. Let me elaborate why. It's going to be difficult because the actors in the food system are different. So if there are actors that say potato or tomato, they're linked with vertical integration, their losses are going to be small. On the other hand, if you talk to the small farmers in the remote areas, they're with a different value chain, and their losses are going to be higher. Now, statistically, if you think about a sampling framework, covering all these heterogeneities in a given society is a monumental task. But we're not sitting idle. I think it pre has started many country case studies to estimate losses and waste. Not waste, mostly losses here. But the waste is a bigger component that we have to look at. Okay. Now come to the after that come to the cost effectiveness. That is the point Ashoka started with on the opening session. And actually you during the opening session he cut out job for me, he gave me some assignment. That assignment was that you need to understand what the cost effectiveness is. So there are challenges there too. What kind of cost effectiveness are you looking at? Are you looking at the economic cost effectiveness or are you looking at social cost effectiveness? These are two very different concepts. Now, economic cost effectiveness, the results that we have seen today, presented by Professor Katie Bellis and our colleagues from the Bihar Studies and Studies in Bangladesh, we see that there's willingness to pay. So three times, that's pretty high. If that is the case, people should be jumping on it. Why are they not? That's the question itself. How do we address that? The second question is, okay, if it is case, then we have to look at what are the constraints behind it. And the only thing I can think of, given the three times cost effectiveness, is that this information asymmetry. Somehow information is not getting to the farmers. That is the challenge. So how do we address that? So we need a broader understanding of, of particular sector and commodities. And then I think it will be effect, more effective for a, for a communication strategy. Let me elaborate why. So I, we just did a survey in Bangladesh of the grain market, rice market. Rice market is in 36 million tons of rice, which is equivalent to about 56 million tons of hay, right? Now, who supplies that pay? Of the marketer surplus, 15% of the farmers supply more than 80% of the commodities to the market. 
If that is the case, that is a section which is viable from an, from an economic perspective. If it is profitable, that section of the farmers, 14% farmers, they don't need subsidies. And they are information savvy too. They should be picking it up as a market. Okay. Then what is left? Left is the smallest holders, poor farmers, net sellers. What do we need for them? That's a very different communication we need to have. That's a different conversation we need to have. Because they need support. And that support is justified because that is on the social protection program. And social protection programs are justified at any level of economic development of the country. So when you think about a communication strategy, you have to think about this. The second part of it, the other part of this, is that understanding social cost and benefit component of it. Is it aflatoxin? Is it cadmium? Is it the contamination? What do we know about it? Yeah. What is the health cost of it? We don't have any estimate of it. I think that estimate is extremely important to make the case for public policy actions. We don't have that yet. We did a little study in Bangladesh. Mr. Mahmood presented in the morning for the rice and wheat, which tested for six different contaminants. So arsenic was not a problem. Aflatoxin was not a problem. Cadmium was not a problem. And there was a trace of mold, but they were pretty safe. So the question is, if you're talking about grain, and we are talking about that there's a social cost to consuming this unsafe food, they're pretty safe. So what are we talking about when we talk about the health risk, health cost of consuming that food? So that has to be different like chain in the dairy chain. That should be maybe the fruits and vegetables that's more important than the savings. It's more important for the ground ones than say rice. So those are some of the issues that we need to understand. We need to come up with the cost, but the social cost associated with that. To, uh, to make the case of the social social interventions. Okay, we talked about subsidy in the morning. I didn't like the term because I told you Ashok was my mentor in the early 2000, and he never talked like the term million subsidy. Now he was in favor of 30 percent subsidy. He surprised me badly this morning. Okay, now. Coming to this, my second bucket, which is the communication, I've talked about it. The question is, what do we do next? Do we have some action plans? I would make a suggestion. This is not even a recommendation. Suggestion is, we have various groups here. Can we form a coalition or an alliance to work on the issues that we've identified here? Can we generate more granular information on the estimates of losses and waste and put it in a platform and, and find out the policy levers of the organizations where you can communicate it and become a forum for that communication. If you can do that, I think as in free South Asia, we'll be happy to partner. And let me share another piece of information with all of you. There is a program at IPRI called Resex Asia, the Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support System. There is one in Africa, there is one in Asia will be co-leading that initiative. That is a platform supported by the Gates Foundation, but other donors are also coming forward to support it. We can make at least one thing that we can make an agenda item, that we look at it, let's try to generate some granular information on some of this estimate and present it to the right form. So could you please repeat it, sorry for the interruption, regional statistical analysis? Regional strategic analysis and knowledge support system. Okay. The second thing we can do, thank you for volunteering Ashok, writing the op-eds. So let's generate those estimates. We have ongoing studies in Bangladesh and we have ongoing studies in Africa. We can get some of those estimates and I'd be happy to write an op-ed with you which can go out in selected countries. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
debate also started on whether the government should be storing, procuring, distributing, or not. Shahid and me and uh, uh, Ralph Cummings, we did a book on six, seven countries' experience yeah. in South and Southeast Asia from parastatals to private trade, how to move. But it was largely food security. Today, when you see the debate, nobody talks of food security as a standalone thing. Everybody talks of food and nutritional security. The whole debate, there is a paradigm shift in that thinking that food, just filling stomachs is not enough. You must look at the nutrition. I want 20 years from today, or even 10 years from today, nobody should talk of increasing productivity without securing food. Because securing food, from resource point of view, may be a cheaper option than producing extra food. Do we have that evidence? That's the first macro question that we need to put at a global level. That investing in securing your food is a much cheaper, better option than keep on giving loans and investing more and more to produce. So that is the first level of changing the debate, changing the paradigm, shift in the mentality. Now, if I have got some technology, where do I go? You know, when the seeds of Green Revolution came, a lot of debate where, where to distribute that. They didn't go to the toughest place where there was huge poverty and, uh, you know, people were dying or starving. They distributed seeds where they had the biggest potential to change the seed which had irrigation, farmers were most progressive, and they could use fertilizers. They went to Punjab, which was already one of the better places, best places perhaps in the country. And therefore, we, when we have a technology, an innovative thing in our hand, we need to map a differentiated market structure for our product. I found there was too much discussion, debate, and research based on smallholders of behalf. I value that very much. My heart cries for the smallholders, but my mind may not be fully convinced with that, that that may not be the right business model. Therefore, we need to look at at least three or four major differentiated markets for my product. Farmers could be just one of them, but farmers, individual farmers, is the most difficult challenge you are doing. And if all your 80%, 90% efforts are going there, the chances that you will succeed and you will scale up, I'm afraid, I'm not be there. Sorry to say that. Within the farmers, if you want to stay, you have to create aggregation. I'm very glad that there was a lot of discussion on that and agreement on that, that we need to create a scale where it can be whether through farmer producer organizations or central system. I would go a step further into a commercial model of promoting warehouse and seed systems. Gentleman said 50% they should get. Actually, in the warehouse receipt system, you can get 70-75% of the market value right away. So that farmer's budgetary constraint, because he cannot hold the produce unless he gets immediate cash. And that he can, by depositing in the warehouse receipt system, he will get 70-75% of the market value. And he can sell it later then. And then the cost of storing and all that can be adjusted. I think we have to push towards that with better research, better information, with better best practices in the countries in which sitting here, what if we can bring in? 
sitting here, if we cannot do too much in Bihar, but it can bring in what is happening in Bangladesh, what is happening, it's the international experience that we can bring in much more and demonstrate that, okay, in this pilot, we can do this. That is the net, and you have global reach, you have global experience, India needs to be exposed to that type of thing. Bangladesh is great, wonderful. What other Southeast Asian countries are doing, what Indonesia is doing, and more importantly, what China is doing. Because that is what India also needs to listen to. I think, right? but farmers, whether aggregated through farmer producer organizations, NABARD is being entrusted to create 10,000 farmer producer organizations. Now, this is a number that comes out of the budget and announcements, big things, and 4,000 already are existing around that. What they are doing, what is the typology, where it can be done, you have to go more granular. Which commodities? Our product will give the biggest bang. Is it maize? Is it wheat? Is it rice? Talking of 30% losses, that is stratosphere. We are not there, we are on the ground. If grains losses, total losses in grains, I heard 4 to 6% from the government to a person in the morning. Right? 4 to 6%. Also, Bangladesh, 5%, 7%, 8%. <coughs> is, now you break that further down. How much is because of storage? There are thrashing losses. Now, can you tackle thrashing losses through hermetic things? Not at all. So, what is it? You can tackle only 2% of the game, 1% of the game. So, talking 30% is taking the focus totally away, diffused. That is good enough for Prasanta in Rome. <laughs> but here, you have to be very granular and come up with, okay, if three crops we pick up, or five crops we pick up, what is the spatial distribution of growth? Huh? What is the lay of the land today? And where we can impact? Can we save this? And this is 1% or 2% or 3%, but even that 2, 3% can be a large amount. And that is where the benefit-cost ratio has to be uh, looked at. I would go by that. But I'm still talking of farmers, farmer organizations, warehouse receipt system. But at present, a larger chunk of the food is being stored by the private traders. Because they buy it, and throughout the year, whether through wheat, mills or rice mills or uh, traders, wholesale traders. Now, I think we may have to talk to them and look at what is the benefit cost ratio and what is the experience and that's where the pilots can be. Because if they can say, ultimately the value captured from this can percolate something to the farmer. If in the entire value chain we can reduce the value loss and the quantity loss. So something will be shared by all these people. Now, I didn't see much discussion. The feed mills could be a start one, a you know, good start, because they are very particular and they need to hold the thing. And corn is one of the products, and Bihar will be a natural place to start with, but looking at the feed millers rather than just the small ones. And can we have a direct contract farming of the feed millers with the uh, farmers and so on and so forth. Those innovative institutional innovations need to be put into place. Now, incentives would be whether the benefit cost ratio is coming up or not. If it is a commercially viable business, it will take off. Because you will have to convince only a few entities, not millions of small holders. You are coming to a few business-oriented uh, people. Then there is a big elephant in the room, especially in India, and that is the government. And government, as on 1st of January, was having a food grain stock of 75.5 million tons. 
against a buffer stock norm of 21.4 million tons annual January, not 42. 42 is July. By July, we will have 90 million tons. Okay? So this was 3.5 times the buffer stock norm, the value of which at economic cost is more than 150,000 crores. Which is dead stop literally in the world. Now, they cannot dispose of overnight. They will have to keep it on their head for the next two years, three years, <coughs> because they don't have the guts to reform the public distribution system. What was said by you today was said to the Prime Ministers five years back exactly what was the date, 22nd of. January. I think the report was presented to the Shanta Kumar panel report is on the website of FCI that was presented to the Prime Minister. And he said, yes, this has to be done. We are still waiting. <laughs> so the question is, there is a bigger issue involved there. But this system is not going to go away overnight. We'll have to live with this system. And they are big consumers. One consumer is such a big consumer. So if you convince two people, four people, five people, the food secretary, the FCA chairman, and even take the discussion and debate to the prime minister's office and say this is so many thousands of crores you can save because these are your losses at present. And if this innovation is, and you bring it under utter innovation you know, mission, you have to see the current video in the government and within that there is an adult innovation system mission and put it under that and show a pilot and take one or two top functionaries to you know, demonstrate, policies can change, right? So I would go for farmers more as a group, looking at traders, looking at bigger players and then the government side because this is what your market is. If you keep your focus which may be your mandate of just the small holders in behalf, well you are doing good work and good luck but I don't think he has the capacity to retain his produce even for two months, three months and he has to dig every day something out of that. So where is the question of sealing it for six months? So, because he needs money immediately after the harvest, that's his problem. And unless we get those systems in place. So, I think, I feel this is an important noble job that you are doing. Like the nutritional security, I think we should keep pushing Communication is one part of the thing, but not based on opinions, based on best practices, based on research like Kathy and uh, uh, the other girl who was doing PhD, uh, sorry, Pallavi, mm -hmm. has been doing. That type of robust research needs to be communicated, not in just your academic journals, but also in op-eds. And Shahid has volunteered. <laughs> now, we have to raise the pitch, we have to raise the level of debate and information. And one thing I know is many of these things do, the cuttings go to the relevant minister or even to the end Right? And given a chance, wherever we will get a chance, we can push it. That's the way to go. Good research. You are doing, and this is what your strength is. Communication is somewhat weaker, needs to be pushed up. You are with the farmers, which is very great. My heart is singing for it. But I think for better success, you may have to identify some other partners where the success is easier and bigger. The Green Revolution is identified with Punjab, not with Eastern UP or the or Punjab may have its own problems, but that's why the scene that we have in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first start with compliments to 
about the gentleman on my both sides here. I'm amazed that so many people are still sitting alert and listening. I don't know, jet lag must be taking a lot of toll. <laughs> you know, I'm just looking 20 years back. The debates on food security, 20, 25 years back, always the focus was increased productivity, increased production. The debate also started on whether the government should be storing, procuring, distributing or not. Shahid and me and uh, uh, all coming soon here. We did a book on six, seven countries experience in South and Southeast Asia from parastatals to private trade, how to move. But it was largely food security. Today, when you see the debate, nobody talks of food security as a standalone thing. Everybody talks of food and nutritional security. The whole debate there is a paradigm shift in that, thinking that food, just filling stomachs is not enough, you must look at the nutrition. I want 20 years from today, or even 10 years from today, nobody should talk of increasing productivity without securing food. Because securing food from resource point of view, it may be a cheaper option than producing extra food. Do we have that evidence? That's the first macro question that we need to put at a global level. That investing in securing your food is a much cheaper, better option than keep on giving loans and investing more and more to produce. So that is the first level of changing the debate, changing the paradigm, shift in the mentality. Now, if I have got some technology, where do I go? You know, when the seeds of green evolution came, there was a lot of debate where, where to distribute that. They didn't go to the toughest place where there was huge poverty and uh, you know people were dying or starving. They distributed seeds where they had the biggest potential to change the seeds, which had irrigation, farmers were most progressive, and they could use fertilizers. They went to Punjab, which was already one of the better places, best places perhaps in the country. And therefore, we, when we have a technology, an innovative thing in our hand, we need to map a differentiated market structure for our product. I found there was too much discussion, debate and research based on smallholders of behalf. I value that very much. My heart cries for the smallholders. But my mind may not be fully convinced with that, that that may not be the right business model. Therefore, we need to look at at least three or four major differentiated markets for my product. Farmers could be just one of them, but farmers, individual farmers, is the most difficult challenge you are doing and if all your 80%, 90% efforts are going there, the chances that you will succeed and you will scale up, I'm afraid, I'm not be there. Sorry to say that. Within the farmers, if you want to stay, you have to create aggregation. I'm very glad that there was a lot of discussion on that and agreement on that, that we need to create a scale where it can be whether through farmer producer organizations or central system, I would go a step further into a commercial model of promoting warehouse and seed systems. Gentlemen said 50% they should get. Actually, in the warehouse receipt system, you can get 70, 75% of the market value right away. So that farmers 
budgetary constraint because he cannot hold the produce unless he gets immediate cash. And that he can by depositing in the warehouse receipt system, he will get 70-75% of the market value and he can sell it later then. And then the cost of storing and all that can be adjusted. I think we have to push towards that with better research, better information, with better best practices in the countries in which sitting here, what if we can bring in? Sitting here, if we cannot do too much in Bihar, but it can bring in what is happening in Bangladesh, what is happening, it's the international experience that we can bring in much more and demonstrate that, okay, in this pilot, we can do this. That is the net, and you have global reach, you have global experience, India needs to be exposed to that type of thing. Bangladesh is great, wonderful, what other Southeast Asian countries are doing, what Indonesia is doing, and more importantly, what China is doing. Because that is what India also needs to listen to. I think that. But farmers, whether aggregated through farmer producer organizations, NABARD is being entrusted to create 10,000 farmer producer organizations. Now this is a number that comes out of the budget and announcements, big things and 4,000 already are existing around that. What they are doing, what is the typology, where it can be done, you have to go more granular. Which commodities our product will give the biggest back? Is it maize? Is it wheat? Is it rice? Talking of 30% losses, that is stratosphere. We are not there, we are on the ground. If grains losses, total losses in grains, I heard four to six percent from the government uh, person in the morning, mm -hmm. right? Four to six percent. Also Bangladesh, five percent, seven percent, eight percent. This is now you break that for the down. How much is because of story? There are thrashing losses. Now can you tackle thrashing losses through hermetic things? Not at all. So what is it? You can tackle only 2% of the game, 1% of the game. So talking 30% is taking the focus totally away, diffused. That is good enough for Prasanta in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> but here, you have to be very granular and come up with, okay, if three crops we pick up, or five crops we pick up, what is the spatial distribution of those? How, what is the lay of the land today and where we can impact? Can we say this? And this is 1% or 2% or 3%, but even that 2, 3% can be a large amount. And that is where the benefit cost ratio has to be uh, looked at. I would go by that. But I'm still talking of farmers, farmer organizations, warehouse receipt system, but at present, a larger chunk of the food is being stored by the private traders. Because they buy it, and throughout the year, whether through wheat uh, mills or rice mills or uh, traders, wholesale traders, now I think we may have to talk to them and look at what is the benefit cost ratio and what is the experience, and that's where the pilots can be. Because if they can say, Ultimately, the value captured from this can percolate something to the farmer if in the entire value chain we can reduce the value loss and the quantity loss. So something will be shared by all these people. Now, I didn't see much discussion. The feed mills could be a start one, you know, good start because they are very particular and they need to hold the thing and corn is one of the products and Bihar will be a natural place to start with but looking at the feed millers rather than just the small ones. And can we have a direct contract farming of the feed millers with the, uh, the farmers and so on and so forth. Those innovative institutional innovations need to be put into place. Now, Incentives would be whether the benefit cost ratio is coming up or not. If it is a 
commercially viable business, it will take off. Because you will have to convince only a few entities, not millions of small holders. You are coming to a few business oriented uh, people. Then there is a big elephant in the room, especially in India, and that is the government. And government, as on 1st of January, was having a food grain stock of 75.5 million tons against a buffer stock norm of 21.4 million tons as on January, not 42. 42 is July. By July, we will have 90 million tons. Okay, so this was 3.5 times the buffer stock norm, the value of which at economic cost is more than 150,000 crores. One by crores, which is dead stock literally. Now, they cannot dispose of overnight. They will have to keep it on their head for the next two years, three years, <coughs> or three years because they don't have the guts to reform the public distribution system. What was said by you today was said to the Prime Ministers five years back, exactly, what was the date, 22nd of January. I think the report was presented to the Shanta Kumar panel report is on the website of FCI that was presented to the Prime Minister. And he said, yes, this has to be done. We are still waiting. <laughs> so the question is, <clears throat> there is a bigger issue involved there. But this system is not going to go away overnight. We'll have to live with this system. And they are big consumers. One consumer is such a big consumer. So if you convince two people, four people, five people, the food secretary, the FCI chairman, and even take the discussion and debate to the prime minister's office and say this is so many thousands of crores you can save because these are your losses at present. And if this innovation is, and you bring it under utter innovation you know, mission, you have to see the current video in the government, and within that there is an utter innovation system mission. And put it under that and show a pilot and take one or two top functionaries to you know, demonstrate, policies can change. Right? So I would go for farmers more as a group, looking at traders, looking at bigger players and then the government side because this is what your market is. If you keep your focus, which may be your mandate of just the small holders in Bihar, well, you're doing good work and good luck, but I don't think he has the capacity to retain his produce even for two months, three months, and he has to dig every day something out of that. So where is the question of sealing it for six months? So, because he needs money immediately after the harvest, that's his problem. And unless we get those systems in place. So, I think, I feel this is an important old job that you are doing. Like the nutritional security, I think we should keep pushing and communication is one part of the thing, but not based on opinions, based on best practices, based on research like coffee and doing. That type of robust research needs to be communicated, not in just your academic journals, but also in op -eds. And Shahid has volunteered. <laughs> now, we had to raise the pitch. We had to raise the level of debate and information. And one thing I know is many of these things do, the cuttings go to the relevant minister or even to be Right? And given a chance, wherever we will get a chance, we can push it. So that's the way to go. Good research. You are doing and this is what your strength is. Communication is somewhat weaker. 
needs to be pushed up. You are with the farmers, which is very great. My heart is singing for it. But I think for better success, you may have to identify some other partners where the success is easier and bigger. Green Revolution is identified with Punjab, not with Eastern UP or Bihar or somewhere else. Punjab may have its own problems, but that's why the seat of Green Revolution was. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Buladi, for the inspiring words. I will now ask Dr. Alex Nelson to offer his concluding remarks and the vote of thanks. Great deal to be thankful for. Um, I want to start, though, by noting that this whole issue of post-harvest loss, of this problem we've been talking about, is primarily a reflection of the tremendous success that this country and this region has had in productivity and production. There's Bob Ziegler in here, he's shaking his head, <laughs> nodding his head, rather. Um, it, it, it is because of the tremendous success, right, the tripling of production or, or of yields, that, that the post-harvest systems become overwhelmed and we see post-harvest losses. Um, because it's actually miraculous success that created this problem, I think there's grounds for confidence and optimism because the kinds of people and the kinds of institutions that created the success in productivity, the Green Revolution, can, can create success in a post-harvest revolution. Uh, uh, this morning began, or, or one of the things I heard this morning when I was sitting up here at 10 o'clock or so, was Ashok Gulati making a call for greater granularity. And I thought I knew what you meant. And each hour, I got a better understanding of the dimensions of granularity, where we need to have greater knowledge, and, and where we need to have um, greater reflection on our approaches and our strategies. Uh, so that's what I am taking away from this day. And that's one of the reasons I feel that, that uh, for me personally, this was a very successful day. And, uh, and I owe all of you uh, collectively uh, a vote of thanks for, for contributing to that. A, a new sense of what solutions might make sense where and where other solutions might make more sense uh, and some not. Whether it's an institutional innovation, a warehouse receipt system, uh, an effort at aggregation, or one technology or another. 